great opportunity and time for us to be hearing from Michelle, given the market uncertainty around the path of inflation and therefore the path of interest rates. And with CPI out tomorrow, uh, it's even more opportune. Um, you know, she's got an extraordinary agenda. We were lucky enough to uh, have Michelle here uh, before she was appointed to governor, uh, and she's uh, still managed to come along despite everything that's on her plate. And so uh, we're really, really appreciative. So thank you very much. Um, Michelle's going to deliver her keynote speech, um, and then we're going to hear a little bit later from our chief economist, Stephen Halmerick, uh, who's going to do some Q&A uh, with Michelle. Um, so, without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, the new Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Michelle Bullock. That's a little bit shorter. Um, well, thank you for that warm welcome and thank you to Matthew for that uh, absolutely beautiful welcome uh, to country. So, good evening. Um, Thank you for inviting me to speak at this event. It, it was uh, quite funny that I accepted it uh, as Deputy Governor, but now I'm Governor, so, and it is my first speech as Governor. And it's a good opportunity for me really to talk about a topic which is at the core of the Reserve Bank's responsibilities, and that's the monetary, monetary policy and the framework uh, within which it's considered. But before I start on that topic, I wanted to comment briefly on recent monetary policy. So as I'm sure you're all aware, the Reserve Bank Board decided earlier this, this month to leave the cash rate at 4.1 per cent, and it's been there since the most recent rate rise in June. Our focus does remain on bringing inflation back to target within a reasonable time frame while keeping employment growing. It's possible that this can be done with the cash rate at its current level, but there are risks that could see inflation return to target more slowly than currently forecast. And the board won't hesitate to raise the cash rate further if there's a material upward revision to the outlook for inflation. At the same time, though, the board is mindful that growth in demand and the rate of inflation have been moderating and that there are long lags in the transmission of monetary policy. Now, the board will receive several pieces of information before its next meeting that will be very important for this assessment. This includes a full update of the staff's forecasts. We're going to reconsider the outlook for the economy in the light of incoming information, and we'll have opportunities to explain our assessment in the media release and the statement on monetary policy, which will follow the November meeting. But the focus of this speech is the broader framework we use when making monetary policy decisions. My remarks are shaped by the fact that while we target low and stable inflation, there are other objectives that the board considers in formulating monetary policy. In many ways, the board's various objectives complement each other. But there are times when they may seem at odds with one another, and the board must consider how to balance its objectives. This potential for trade-offs can arise between our objectives for price stability or low inflation on the one hand and full employment, or it might arise between those two objectives and our objective of maintaining financial stability. To preface my key observation here, I'd say that while sometimes there are balances to be struck, there are many more ways in which our objectives complement each other. Now, most of you will be well acquainted with the RBA's monetary policy objectives, maintaining low and stable inflation and full employment. These have long been at the centre of our monetary policy framework. The independent review of the Reserve Bank of Australia recognised that this framework has served Australia well. It recommended some enhancements to modernise and clarify the objectives, and I'm currently working with the Treasurer to do this. These changes won't, however, fundamentally change the way we formulate monetary policy. I think the inflation objective is widely understood because it's been the centrepiece of monetary policy since the 1990s. The board has targeted a rate of consumer price inflation of between 2 and 3 per cent on average over time, a flexible inflation target, we call it. Now, this inflation target is central to monetary policy because it contributes to the economic prosperity and welfare of Australia in two ways. 
The first is by avoiding the direct damage that high inflation does to households and businesses. High inflation erodes the value of savings, it reduces the purchasing power of households, it especially hurts those on low incomes. And as former Governor Philip Lowe often stated, history has taught us that sustained high inflation inevitably leads to higher interest rates and unemployment. Now, the second way that achieving the inflation target helps Australians is by laying the foundations for economic growth and job creation. Maintaining low inflation gives households and firms certainty when planning for the future. It also facilitates a better allocation of resources. And both of these, in turn, support increased investment and productivity growth. The Board's second objective is to maintain full employment. Now, I've noticed previously um, in other speeches that it's actually very hard to overstate the importance of full employment. Being employed not only supports people financially, but it also provides them with a sense of purpose, helps to foster mental and physical well-being. And these benefits are especially felt by those that find it harder to get jobs, such as the young or the less educated. And there are actually broader societal benefits from the higher workforce involvement, such as an in, uh, increased prospect of more and more diverse ideas being generated. The RBA has always had a full employment mandate alongside low and stable inflation, but we're now adopting the review's recommendation to make that dual mandate more explicit. So what is full employment? In theory, it's the level of employment at which there's a balance between demand and supply in the labour market and in the market for goods and services at the same time as inflation is at the inflation target. So it's like the maximum level of employment that it's consistent with our price stability mandate. If you think about it, when demand for workers is well below this and unemployment is high, inflation will typically fall below our target. Wage growth will be low and Australians will suffer the financial and social costs of unemployment. In contrast, when demand for workers is very strong and the unemployment rate is very low, inflation will typically be high. It can also be difficult to acquire goods and services as we need them in these circumstances, and firms struggle with high vacancies and staff turnover. I'd say that these observations, these outcomes, are not just observations from the distant past, as some, some of them claim. They have actually been the experience for the past 10 or 20 years. And that's shown in the first graph. While inflation um, appropriately has a numerical target, the two to three I talked about, it would actually be unwise to specify a fixed numerical target for full employment. For one thing, full employment can change over time as the structure of the economy evolves. And it's also not a concept that can be directly measured. And it can't be comprehensively summarised by a single statistic like the unemployment rate. As the government's white paper, uh, recent white paper on employment explained, the modern workforce includes almost two and a half million people who either want to work but are not counted as unemployed, or they'd like to work more hours than they currently do. So these considerations mean it's not straightforward, nor is it desirable, to set a numerical and enduring target for full employment. Now, much has been written over the past month about whether full employment means different things to the Reserve Bank and the government. The answer is no. Our objectives are complementary, but we typically have different time horizons to work with. So the focus of monetary policy is the short to medium term, a period between, say, a few quarters and a few years. But governments rightly have a much longer horizon when thinking about full employment. And over a longer horizon, the level of employment can be sustainably, that can be sustainably achieved while keeping inflation consistent with the target. It can be influenced by various forces, including government policies. So how do we judge where full employment is at any time? Now, one way of trying to gauge what labour market outcomes are currently consistent with this definition of full employment is to estimate what we call the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, or the NARU. 
This concept, I'd have to say, has generated quite a bit of debate over recent months. Let me be clear, it's a statistical measure estimated by observing the joint behaviour of inflation and unemployment, along with various other influences. But I want to emphasise that this can only be a starting point for assessing labour market conditions, because the Nairu is estimated imprecisely, especially in real time. It also doesn't capture all the relevant information. So our assessment of what labour market conditions currently constitute full employment therefore incorporates a lot of judgement. Other factors, such as how broader measures of underutilisation are evolving relative to unemployment, trends in wage setting mechanisms and mobility, and importantly, wage and inflation outcomes. These are all part of our considerations. There's also been much discussion about the potential balance between the board's objectives. Some commentators have expressed concern that a more explicit employment objective would mean we deprioritise inflation, and others are worried that the board has unduly prioritised lowering inflation over preserving jobs. Now, while it's true that there can sometimes be a need to consider how to balance these objectives, there are actually more complementarities between them than often is recognised. Over time, low inflation and full employment go hand in hand. Low and stable inflation is a prerequisite for strong and sustainable employment growth because it creates favourable conditions for households and businesses to make decisions about how to use their resources. It's also true that when unemployment is persistently away from full employment, inflation will persistently deviate from the target. So our two objectives are complementary over the longer term. And I'd say even in the shorter term, the two objectives are complementary. It's certainly true when the economic cycles are being driven mainly by strengthening or weakening demand. When that happens, employment and inflation tend to rise and fall together. And as a result, the policy response that returns inflation to target also moves the labour market toward full employment. The employment and, full and inflation objectives are also complementary when there are influences that expand the productive capacity of the economy, like strong productivity growth, successful innovation and expansions in the capital stock. It's only when faced with negative supply disruptions that there may be a need to think about potential trade-offs. For example, disruptions to energy supply or natural disasters can cause inflation to rise above target at the same time as unemployment increases. Now, it's not wise to specify in advance a fixed rule for how to balance our objectives because the appropriate response is going to depend on the circumstances. If a supply disruption is transitory and modest, monetary policy should mostly look through it. In contrast, when a shock has a longer lasting effect on the economy and inflation, or there's a series of supply shocks in one direction, there are stronger grounds for monetary policy to respond. But this brings us to the very important role of inflation expectations. When households and businesses have a high level of confidence that the board will do what is needed to return inflation to target, we can afford to look through a greater share of negative supply shocks, even those that might last for a lengthy period. Now, of course, there's limits here. The longer a central bank permits inflation to remain outside of target, the more likely it is that inflation expectations will shift. And if they do, it will require even higher interest rates and unemployment to bring inflation back to target. So given these considerations, the board's approach, when faced with a need to balance its objectives, is to explain how we're managing them and why. Over the past year, we've done this through the analogy of aiming to tread a narrow path in which inflation returns to target within a reasonable time frame while employment continues to grow. As we've been saying for some time, it might have been possible to get inflation down back to target sooner by raising the cash rate more sharply. However, doing so would have caused greater hardship for households and businesses and ultimately higher unemployment. As such, the board judged that at that time, the costs outweighed the gains from restoring inflation to target quicker. At the same time, though, the board has been clear that it has a low tolerance for allowing inflation to return to target more slowly than currently expected. 
Accepting this would risk eroding public credibility in our commitment to low and stable inflation. And as I've discussed, the long-term cost to the economy, if that were to happen, would be considerable. Now, a second potential trade-off in monetary policy frameworks is between financial stability and the inflation and full employment objectives. And my main observation here again is that these objectives are more often complementary than, than people assume. The RBA has long had a mandate to contribute to financial stability. Over the past quarter of a century, this has included working very closely with the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority and other members of the Council of Financial Regulators to promote stability in the financial system. And it's pleasing to us that the review of the, the, review of the Reserve Bank recommended that this mandate become more explicit. Most of the time, the RBA's financial stability objective is intrinsically linked and complementary to its objectives for inflation and unemployment. Monetary policy can't achieve low inflation and full employment without a stable financial system. For example, financial instability can result in supply of credit being unduly constrained, which disrupts economic activity and results in rising unemployment. Unemployment, in turn, is the most common reason why households and firms are unable to pay debts that are owed to banks. And high inflation can also trigger financial difficulties for households and businesses, and hence financial institutions. But there are times when what is needed to achieve full employment and low inflation may not be ideal for maintaining financial stability. For example, an extended period of accommodative monetary policy to lift employment and inflation can contribute to a build-up of leverage and imprudent risk-taking in parts of the financial system. And a sharp, monetary, a sharp tightening in monetary policy at a later point to control inflation can then expose those vulnerabilities. And this was one contributor to what happened into the United States earlier this year with the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. In general, the board balances its objectives by considering financial stability in its policy settings without using monetary policy to influence financial stability directly. Financial stability considerations will influence monetary policy when it affects the outlook for employment and inflation. For example, if financial stability results in tighter credit conditions, as I said, this is relevant for meeting the bank's objectives. But if there seems to be tension between these objectives, the board will usually prioritise its inflation and full employment objectives. This approach is widely accepted as best practice and it is consistent with the recommendations of the review of the Reserve Bank. It reflects the principle that other agencies and their tools, most notably APRA, the Potential Regulation Authority, are better placed to prevent the build-up of financial vulnerabilities than monetary policy is. And it recognises that consistently achieving multiple objectives requires multiple tools. So I thought to make this discussion a bit more tangible, it might be instructive to consider the Board's most recent reflections on financial stability at, at its October meeting. The Board concluded that while risks to financial stability are currently high, given the challenging economic environment, most households in Australia and most businesses have been resilient and our financial system remains strong. At the same time, we assess that these risks did not currently have a major bearing on monetary policy. One aspect of this assessment involved considering how different household groups are faring in response to high inflation and interest rates. And one way of illustrating this is through the lens of changes in spare cash flow over the prior two years. Inflation, and you can see in this graph, that inflation, excluding housing costs, has weighed twice as heavily on spare cash flows of lower income households compared with those on higher incomes. So lower on the left hand side, higher on the right hand side. But the differential impact from inflation has on average been offset by stronger growth in labour income for those on lower incomes. So when you look at the net change, it isn't a lot different. The financial pressures that households are facing can also vary depending on whether they own their home outright, have a mortgage or rent. On average, 
Households with a mortgage have experienced a significant decline in spare cash flows, unlike other households, and that's evident um, from the left-hand side. For these households, higher interest costs have reduced their cash flow by more than the rise in inflation has. By contrast, the spare cash flows of renters, which is in the middle there, um, has on average risen as little as Spare cash flows renters has on average risen a little as high inflation and rising rents have been more than offset by growth in income. There's going to, of course, be very diverse outcomes from individuals within these groups, though. So this is just a median. An alternative way of assessing the pressure on households with, their mortgage, with a mortgage is to look at the income of households with variable rate loans relative to their mortgage costs and some benchmark estimates of essential living expenses. Now, the main insight from this approach was that the pressure facing indebted households is much greater for a small group of highly leveraged borrowers than for those with more modest levels of debt. About 5% of all variable rate borrowers are estimated to be paying more for essential expenses and housing than they receive in income. But if you look at highly leveraged borrowers, which is the top line, that's about 25% of those highly leveraged borrowers. Have, so they're people with loans amounting to at least four times their income. 25% of them are estimated to be paying more for essential expenses and housing than they receive in income. That's a much bigger group. These borrowers might be finding ways to make ends meet, but this can involve some difficult financial decisions. It could include drawing on past savings, working extra hours if they're able, or foregoing some expenditure that, in normal times, might be considered non-discretionary expenditure. At the extreme, it could involve negotiating a hardship program with their lender or selling their property. Now, it's important to acknowledge that all of these findings are based on average incomes for various groups and households. Within each group, there's going to be individual households that are better off and some that are worse off than average. Indeed, we speak directly to organisations that provide debt advice and mental health services, and we're hearing regularly that many households are under significant financial stress, and we discuss this regularly in board meetings. But at the same time, the bank's statutory objectives are economy-wide outcomes, and our key tool, the interest rate, is a very blunt one. The board recognises the effects of monetary policy on the welfare of different individuals, but it must set its policy to serve the welfare of Australians collectively. Now, before I conclude, I quickly want to note that this year marks the 40th anniversary of the float of the Australian dollar. Um, it's therefore a good time to remind ourselves of the benefits of floating the dollar uh, and the benefits that creates for the monetary framework in Australia. So floating um, the exchange rate has given the RBA flexibility to set monetary policy independently of the decisions of other major central banks, although global capital flows mean we can't set policy in a vacuum. Interest rate volatility declined sharply at the same time as exchange rate volatility picked up when we floated, and the exchange rate has worked as a shock absorber to macroeconomic <laughs> developments. As a result, the Australian economy has mostly been able to absorb external shocks without large inflationary or deflationary pressures that had previously characterised the economy. The benefits of the floating the Australian dollar were especially clear during the mining boom in the 2000s. At that time, strong global demand for Australia's resources saw the terms of trade increase by about 75 per cent. This substantially increased demand for Australian dollars and the exchange rate appreciated significantly. The additional demand for Australian products um, and the wealth this created would have been inflationary in prior periods, but we were able to keep inflation around target with only modest increases in interest rates as the exchange rate appreciation dampened inflation. The reverse was true as the mining boom subsided over the second half of the 2010s. Um, in contrast to these periods, the exchange rate has been reasonably stable over the past two years in trade-weighted terms. While the exchange rate remains an important channel of monetary policy transmission, the recent stability in the trade-weighted exchange rate means that it hasn't played a large role in recent monetary policy decisions. 
So to conclude, in making decisions on monetary policy, the Board's focus is on delivering low and stable inflation while maintaining full employment. It also considers whether financial stability might have implications for monetary policy settings. In many cases, the objectives are complementary. But there may be sometimes a need to balance the various objectives, and this requires careful judgment. It is incumbent on the Board to be transparent about when and how it's doing this. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions a little later. So, as uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, my name is Stephen Halmerick. I'm the Chief Economist of Commonwealth Bank. And it's my absolute uh, pleasure and privilege to uh, run the Q&A session with Michelle Bullock, the Governor of the Reserve Bank. So, again, thank you very much for your speech today. We've really um, appreciated it. Um, so, what we're going to do is I'll just ask a couple of questions and then we'll throw to the, um, throw to the audience, especially those that are at our conference and then we will have some time for some questions from the, from the media. So I'm just going to start, uh, Governor, with a question about the global perspective. Now, I think for, for Phil Lowe, for your predecessor, it really was you know, a, a, a massive global development that kind of defined his term and the reaction to that. So, of course, the pandemic. And then we had uh, you know, this surge in inflation that everyone's dealing with. So as you've started your, your term, we've got... Uh, another big global development, or multiple. Uh, so, unfortunately, geopolitical developments are now two hot wars, one in Europe, one in the Middle East, and, of course, uh, ongoing impact of climate change. So I'm just thinking, you know, how do those global developments, the, 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 big, uh, the big changes, how are they considered at the bank, you know, by the board and by yourself, and, you know, what's the reaction function that we might expect to those type of events? Mm, sure, thanks. Um, so, yes, um, we've had, I think I said in another context, shock after shock after shock here at the moment. Um, we, the um, pandemic shock obviously was of one type, a particular supply shock, particularly impacted supply chains. Um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a very big energy price shock, um, massive um, implications, particularly for Europe. Um, um, Australia was to some extent isolated a bit, but we're starting to see impacts of that come through now. The, the, current, the current circumstance with the Israel-Gaza situation um, also potentially uh, has um, energy price issues. Um, we did see the price of oil rise a bit but, but on, on that um, circumstance, but I think the main issue we've got now is just this great deal of uncertainty about what next. Um, and it's not just about energy prices. Um, it's another symptom of the fragmentation that's going on around the world. Um, one of the um, things that's been happening over recent years, uh, in contrast to perhaps the decade before, was that we are seeing um, much more think, uh, countries thinking much more about the security of their supply chains. It used to always be about where do we go to get the cheapest um, supplies, cheapest mm. goods, cheapest labour? Now we're thinking about, well, you know, maybe there needs to be some sort of security of, of supply for some of our industries here. So we're starting to see things like that happen, and that, that ultimately um, isn't positive for a country like Australia, which has, mm. has done a lot in terms of uh, being an open economy and open to trade. Um, so I think... Um, just the uncertainty of what's going to happen with this current conflict. Does it spread? What are the implications for the world trading system in those circumstances? Um, are there implications for uh, oil prices again? Which is, uh, and, and remember that we're in a period of high inflation already. Yeah. So one more, one more supply shock on top of that doesn't help. So I think, you know, in terms of reaction function for monetary policy, I, I don't think there is a firm reaction function for monetary policy. I think we're dealing in just very uncertain times, even more uncertain than usual. Mm. And it's going to be really important to be watching the data and what's happening overseas, um, uh, even more so. Yeah, certainly plenty to keep your eye on. <laughs> yes. Um, so domestically, as Andrew mentioned in the introduction, we've got inflation numbers tomorrow. So, you know, market's kind of hanging, hanging off that number. We're seeing some deceleration in the inflation rate, but you know, it clearly remains too high. 
Um, so when thinking about monetary policy and the, you know, the, the response of the economy to monetary policy, um, is there anything particular that you're, you're looking at or you know, what you're gauging through? Yeah. Um, as you know, at ComBank, we've recently released what we call the Household Spending Insights Report, which is spending right across the economy through the Commonwealth Bank network. Um, but how do you judge what impact interest rates are having, you know, how far you are through the process, uh, over and above you know, what the CPI might print out tomorrow? Sure. Um, so I think there's, there's contrasting um, forces happy, happening here. On, on the one hand, household balance sheets on average, on, in aggregate, are actually pretty solid. Um, they've got lots, still got lots of savings, um, and they're still saving. The savings rate in Australia is still positive. Yeah. So they've got uh, lots of buffers, lots of saving. Um, we are seeing housing prices rising again, so wealth is rising again. Um, so household balance sheets in that, in that respect are, are solid. Um, again, I want to qualify it by saying that I know that there are differences of experience here, that there are some people that are doing it much more tougher than others, but monetary policy is an aggregate demand sort of concept rather than individuals. We know it impacts people very differently. So you've got that happening. On the other hand, real household disposable incomes have taken a big hit. And they've taken a big hit uh, in um, three ways. One, one is interest rates for those that are in debt, but the bigger hit is from inflation, and that's hit everyone. So you've, you, we've observed that real household disposable income has declined, and two of the big reasons are inflation, and the other, the other reason, in fact, is uh, tax has gone up, yeah. uh, which you would know. Um, yep. And that's, that's a product of lots more people being employed, so there's lots more tax being collected, obviously, from incomes and also a product of the progressive um, and non-indexed tax, tax system. So on the other hand, then, you've got um, balance sheets look good, household disposable income looks very weak, and we are seeing that consumption is slowing. We are seeing um, discretionary spending slowing, and you might be seeing this in your insights yeah, data. We are, for sure, yeah. Um, I know that a lot of people talk about the fact that household, um, that uh, per capita consumption is declining. Aggregate consumption is still at a reasonable level, but population is keeping that up. But um, in um, per capita, people are spending less. So those are indications to us that, um, that spending is slowing, that demand is slowing, and it's not just interest rates that are doing that, it's also inflation which is doing that. Um, and that suggests to us that monetary policy is, is having an impact. We are seeing inflation slow. We'll wait and see what happens tomorrow, but we have been seeing it come down. We have been seeing a demand come down, and that's all, all positive. Having said that, again, these savings buffers, they're sitting there. Mm. Do people use them to support their consumption or not? Um, that's one uncertainty. I mentioned housing prices again. Housing prices are on the rise again, and, and we know from history that housing, rising housing prices tend to uh, result in um, high consumption. So there's, there's that as well, which is impacting things. So um, it's, it's, it is a balancing act, and they're the sorts of things we'll be looking at, the inflation numbers, obviously, and um, our new set of forecasts. So that's... A big agenda for November. Big, big agenda for November, indeed. Yeah, yes. sure. Um, so now I'd like to um, open the questions up to the floor. Here's your opportunity for our, our clients and guests here to uh, ask a question of the Governor that there's um, some microphones roaming around. So if you do have a question, uh, perhaps just maybe put up your hand and we'll see if we can spot you and um, get a microphone to you. And can I ask that people just keep the questions short and to the point so we'll get through as many as possible and just um, state your name and your affiliation so that'd be, that'd be great. So who would like to go first? There's one here. Oh, oh, Adam, do you, I don't know whether you can go first. OK. So I've organised most of the conference and asked about 100 questions, so it was kind of a big <laughs> treat. Um, go for it. A fascinating speech. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Um, and it's really good, the speeches that talk about the framework and, and how the current situation relates to that. Um, I guess. What I heard to some degree was that the inflation target is a fairly hard and fast number and the full employment target is perhaps a little bit more fungible and uh, what relates to that inflation number. So is that 
correct in terms of the current lay of the land and when we're thinking about a CPI tomorrow and the, the outlook? Mm. Is that the, the thing that really is exercising your mind the most at the moment, given everything you spoke about? Sure. Um, I wouldn't call it, I mean, it's, it's hard and fast in one sense, in that it's two to three on average over time. But one of the advantages of our particular inflation target, I think, is that it is flexible, which means that if we're out of target on either, you know, above three or below two, um, we can allow ourselves time to get back into target. And that's one of the advantages of our framework, I think. It, it, it means that um, if we think we can bring it down a bit slower, and, and that's what we're trying to do, where um, we could, as I said in the speech, we could actually raise interest rates very sharply and you'd be guaranteed inflation would come down sharply, but you might do some damage on the way. So the advantage of our inflation target is it is flexible. It allows us time if we think we need it. But we still have to be mindful that we don't want to be out of, out of the target too long. Um, the, the point at the, in the current juncture, of course, is that we're dealing with a situation where initially it was big supply shocks coupled with... And, and if we, if we think back um, early on when the inflation issue started, there was a lot of discussion about the transitory nature of inflation. It's a supply shock, it'll wash through. And it soon became evident that it wasn't washing through. Um, we are observing the transitory components come off, so a lot of the energy prices, the goods prices that were, were caught up in supply chains, those things are all coming off. But what we're observing now, not only here, but also overseas, is that services price inflation is elevated. So we've observed a situation where businesses and, and, uh, and um, particularly um, workers have observed that inflation has gone up and they are now putting up their prices or putting up their wages, demands, uh, to meet those slightly higher expectations. Now, the, the thing at the moment is we think inflation expectations are still reasonably well anchored but the longer you remain out of that band, the more likely it is you'll become unanchored. So, so I hope that sort of answers the question. <clears throat> Next question. There's one over there, Michael. Yeah. Uh, Eric Johnston uh, with the Australian. Thank you for your speech, Governor, and um, I'll just um, point, you, you raised the issue around Nauru in your speech, and in a, you made some recent comments about sustainable balance in terms of employment and the employment market, yeah, and you also issued... I can't hear him. Oh, you seem to have lost you. Technique two. Oh, there we go. Something's wrong with the microphone. He comes down the mic, or we can just shout it, and I can repeat the questions. It's always, it's always good to have a plan B. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so you, you raised some comments about Nauru in your speech, and thank you for that. Uh, you've previously made some comments about the employment market being in sustainable balance. However, uh, I just wonder if you're thinking around a number, an absolute number around that is probably more granular now rather than what it was previously. You're asking me what you, I think the Nauru is. <laughs> um, I'm a little reluctant to um, talk about it in that sense because every time I do, people think I'm targeting it, um, which um, I want to make absolutely clear. We don't target a number for Nauru and we don't target an unemployment rate. Um, um, some previous comments I've made have been interpreted that way. We don't, we don't target anything. What we are aiming to do is bring inflation back down while continuing to keep employment growing. Um, if employment grows a little more slowly than the population, the workforce, then that might mean that the um, unemployment rate drifts up. But that, that's, that's not something we're targeting. So um, I'm, I'm reluctant to give you a number for the Nauru because the bands around it are so big. And, and if, you, if you'd said a few years ago that we could get infl um, unemployment rate down to 3.5%, um, and you know we've got some inflation, but there's a lot of supply driven within that, um, I don't think anyone would have believed 
believed it. So um, I think we need to be quite open minded about what the level of the NIRU might be. Another question, please? Up oh, one here. Michael, behind you. There we go. Yeah. Hello. Um, Kim from New Zealand Debt Management. Uh, I was really interested if you had any observations uh, or compare and contrast the approach that's being taken in Australia compared to New Zealand. Um, you may be aware the Reserve Bank of New Zealand has the OCR at 5.5%. Uh, if, if you have any observations on that. Um, well, I think, I mean, they did move early and they did move fast, and I think they had a um, certainly a higher inflation rate than, than we did. Um, I, I think that we have um, taken a, a much more, I think we have taken a more cautious approach. Um, we, um, I think the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, in fact, even suggested that they would need to have a recession to, um, to get inflation back down. We, we've always been conscious that we wanted to try and avoid, avoid that if we possibly could, and that, that sort of informed our, informed our approach. So um, I, think a slightly different, I think a slightly different approach, but also I think quite different circumstances um, in terms of their inflation and ours. So. The statistics said New Zealand had a recession, then they got revised yes, away, so they haven't had one yet. They haven't had one yet. Like another question here? Um, hi, Michelle. Stella Chiu from Reuters. Uh, I just have a question about the CPI report tomorrow. Um, so apparently the, the trimmed mean measure of CPI is forecast to rise 1.1% 1 .1 in the third quarter, and that's above your expectations in August. Uh, do you think that's enough to justify a hike in November? Or do you think? Now I'm going to. I'm going to. Got me to answer. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll say what I said when someone asked me a similar question the other week was, I really hope you're not asking me for forward guidance. <laughs> um, I'm Le not going to. Less than 24 hours. I'm not. I'm not going to comment uh, on it like that. What I will say is that. Um, since we, we, since we last did our forecast, there's been a number of things that have happened in different directions. You've had um, fuel prices increase more than was sort of expected. At the same time, we've had uh, energy prices not increase by as much as expected. Market services may be up a bit. So there's ups and downs. So uh, I won't give you a forecast, and I certainly won't give any forward guidance. <clears throat> Over here. Right behind you. Thanks, Rach. Hi, David from CSE France. Um, well, she just said that you don't want to give forward guidance, but uh, you assess, given your speech, that um, we are behind the curve in Australia. And when will you catch it? Because you don't want to get ahead of it. The inflation is not, you, it's still, behind, it's still high. So we're behind the curve. In, in, what, in what sense are we behind the curve? Well, inflation is not coming down as fast as you wish. You say you don't want to kill the economy. I understand that. But you always, I mean, the RBA has been saying that you have a very low tolerance into inflation. So when it keeps high that level, mm. at some point the tolerance will come yeah. to an end. So uh, we have, um, our current forecasts have inflation coming back into the top of the band in 2025. So yes, it is, it is a reasonable tolerance, but we don't have a lot of tolerance for it to shift out. That's sort of at the, at the end of our, our tolerance, I think. Um, um, so, uh, I wouldn't say we're behind the curve, I'd say we've been um, a bit more cautious. And just remember too that in Australia, we've got variable rate mortgages that have hit households much harder than they've hit many other countries. In the United States, with 30-year mortgages, their consumers have not been impacted by um, increase. Sorry? Yes, but what happens in those circumstances is that turnover falls in the housing market because people don't want to give up their very low rate mortgages and get new mortgages. So there's a whole lot of things that happen in response to that. We've got variable rate mortgages, more fixed rate than we did in the past, but they were very short, quite short terms. So we have a much more direct and quick impact on, how, on, on mortgage holders' um, finances than 
many other countries do. So I, I think that's one reason why we need to be a bit more cautious than some others. In, um, and I wouldn't say we were behind the curve either. I, I, I think um, you'd find that our inflation took off later um, and therefore our interest rates started to rise a little bit later. We, we, we sort of opened up from the pandemic a bit later and it took a little time for inflation to pick up here. Um, so if you sort of looked at where we, where we started raising interest rates relative to when inflation really started to take off, I don't think we're that far behind the curve. There's one way up the back there. Hi, stand Michelle. Up, stand My up, name please. is Fiona. I work for the Commonwealth Bank. Um, you've spoken about full employment incorporating a lot of judgment um, and that it's not necessarily measured by a single figure. Um, I'm just wondering if you could please share what trends you see that are influencing that figure or set of metrics um, and what surprised you the most as well in relation to that. Sorry, I sort of missed your question because I was trying to see where you were. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll stand up. Yeah, sorry. I'm only just... little when I stand, though, too. That's, that's... <laughs> all right. You're in good company. You're, it's you're all good. in very good company here, yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, sorry. <laughs> I'm just really interested to hear about um, how you consider full employment. You mentioned that it's not one single metric and that there's a lot um, yep. that goes into that. Um, and what particular trends or metrics you've seen? We've heard today from speakers earlier about underemployment and how how that's also shifted. So I'm just really interested to see how you think about that. Sure. So there's, a, there's quite a few things that we look at. Um, I guess our assessment at the moment is that the labour market still remains quite tight, but it's not as tight as it was. Things are easing. And there's a few indicators of that. So some of the things we would look at in that context are um, vacancies, job vacancies, which have come off quite a bit, uh, turnover. Um, in terms of the employment statistics, we certainly look at things like um, uh, youth unemployment, medium-term unemployment, which are things that often turn a bit quicker. We look at hours worked, so that's often a margin, and, and I think we're seeing that now. You're seeing that hours work are, is coming off a bit, so that's another margin of adjustment. So these are all things that, in addition to the unemployment rate, um, give you a bit of a feel for um, how the market is, is working through. And I think all of those things at the moment, you're seeing um, a rise in the underemployment rate, so people would like more hours, or they'd like another part-time job, um, they're not getting them, vacancies are down, uh, youth unemployment is up uh, a bit. It, it's, still, it's still much lower than it's been, but it's starting to rise. Um, Medium-term unemployment is rising as well. So all of these things suggest that the unemployment rate just sitting there, there's things adjusting around it, and that's, I think, a sign that the market is adjusting. I might actually sneak one more question in than before. I think we've got one more from the audience. But you, you mentioned briefly at the RBA review. So we've got quite a few international uh, guests with us today. So mm. maybe just an opportunity to quickly summarise how, uh, if you like, the mechanics are going to change next year, the move to eight meetings per year. Mm. Board meetings will take two days rather than one day. Yeah new board needs to be constituted? Maybe just a quick sure. analysis uh, of that. Just, yeah, just very quickly. So we are moving to eight meetings a year from our February meeting. We've published the dates on our website for those. Um, they will now start um, on the afternoon of the Monday and they will conclude at lunchtime on the Tuesday. So we'll have effectively a full day. Um, and the sort of material, obviously, in those circumstances we'll be reporting to the board is going to be a bit different. Um, I think we're going to be looking at much more uh, uh, scenario analysis, um, options, strategy. These are all sorts of things that the, the review suggested we be doing, and certainly we are, we are moving that direction. Having said that, it's going to be a suck it and see. We're going to make some changes, and we're going to see how it goes, and... and um, uh, but yes, we're def definitely moving in that direction. And I should add, with a, a press conference um, after each meeting is the other thing that will yep. happen. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. So I think there was one final question over here. Where was it? Uh, up the back. Yeah. Go Thank ahead. you. Th thanks, Michelle. It's Rachel Klun from the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age newspapers. Just following up on uh, Stephen's question, actually, in terms of the recommendations for the Reserve Bank review and changing the culture of the bank. You mentioned before making the dual mandate more explicit, but what other recommendations are you working on right at this moment? Uh, well, uh, there's a variety of things. So the, the government obviously is, is working on um, things to do with the legislation and the statement on the conduct of monetary policy. We don't control that. 
The things we control um, are the things I've already mentioned in terms of meetings, press conferences. Um, we're thinking about the structure of the bank, so you might recall that there was some recommendations around appointing a chief operating officer and a chief communications officer, so we're working on, on those recommendations. Um, we're working on the issues surrounding the monetary policy processes that the review talked about, so more on strategy, how do we think about integrating research uh, more into uh, the monetary policy processes, and the, um, so that, we're working on that as well. Um, and um, the other piece that we're working on um, is the culture piece. So you might recall there was a, um, a piece in the review that talked about culture and people feeling comfortable to um, challenge and uh, debate and have different, different views. Uh, we're actually uh, embarking on a big piece of work on that as well. So they're the main things that we're focusing on at the moment. Well, thank you. Uh, that's uh, actually unfortunately brought us to the end of the time for the, the Q&A. So I just want to uh, ask everybody to please join me in thanking again Michelle Bullock, Governor of the Reserve Bank. So